Welcome folks, uh, the topic today, uh, I'll introduce in a minute, but uh, the will be supposed to the general logistics uh, monthly webinar we do on agile and software development topics in general. Um, we'll have 45 minutes or so of presentation, uh, we'll take some questions along the way, and then we'll still keep another 10-15 minutes at the end for general broader questions pertaining to the topic. The topic today is life cycle of a user story, so we'll use the analogy of, of life cycle to really uh, examine and do a deeper dive on the user's, user story technique, how user stories morph over time and during the pro software project. And to cover this topic, uh, we have our, uh, um, uh, our um, frequent presenter, Michael Hall with us. Michael uh, is CEO and founder of Three Beacons, uh, and he's himself actually a software practitioner and team leader, certified Scrum Master and certified Scrum product owner, and has been an early adopter of Agile methods since 2001, um, well before it became formalized in the Agile Manifesto and so on. So I'm glad to have uh, Michael present this topic to us. Three Beacons, his company that he started, is a leading provider of Agile training and consulting services. You can learn more about them at their website, www.3beacons.com. With that, uh, over to you, Mike. Okay, folks, uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, today is already a good day. Usually when Hemant introduces me, he says something about me being a, a senior agilist or something along those lines, and it's just his um, polite, cultural way of saying I'm a little bit old, and so I appreciate him <laughs> not mentioning that again today. So, um, well, let's talk about the life cycle of a user story. And I'm going to use this analogy um, of the life cycle that we as humans uh, experience. Um, so you can think of a life cycle as a series of stages in which something passes through during its lifetime. And the, uh, the thing can be a person, it can be a product, it can be a company, it can be a culture, it can be a user story. So the word life cycle implies these stages. Um, I've chosen these five stages. Maybe there's some, some additional ones that you would like to add, but um, we're going to talk today about the conception of user stories, their birth, the growth aspects of a user story, the eventual maturation of a user story, and then yes, the end of life. So let's jump right into it. Let's talk about the first stage, the conception, and how user stories are conceived. Well, primarily user stories are uh, discovered, if you will, or conceived through collaborative conversations. And at this point, uh, from a conception perspective, we really only need the user story names, um, not yet the description and acceptance criteria, but I'll show you that here in just a minute. So think of it as the names of the user stories. It's a good way to kick off your project. Um, hold those discussions where you're, um, you know, talking about the project vision and the ideation of it and come up with the user story names because most of us, or we all know, that the user story is the decomposable work unit that we want to get to in our Agile projects. And also, I'll remind you that user stories are those that require stimulus from the user. Now, the user can be human or not. Um, it can be a, you know, a user of your system or your application, or it can be another system, an upstream processor or downstream data mart or something like that. And, you know, from uh, when are they conceived? Well, certainly uh, during initial planning as the upfront vision discussion ensues. But also, um, you know, anytime you're discussing other stories, oftentimes discussing another story leads to the discovery of a new user story. Or even, um, you know, looking at a really big user story, often called epic, uh, looking at that and breaking that down can be thought of as conceiving new, perhaps more granular, user stories. So um, let's talk about uh, some terminology here before we go much further. Um, 
the classic definition of an epic is, well, it sounds kind of funny, but it's it's a really big user story, according to Mike Cohn and his seminal book on user stories applied. So epics can also be thought of as a major business thrust or perhaps capability areas that the product needs to gather or maintain a market. Now, I'm going to follow the SAFE the scaled agile framework definition of how to break down you know epics into stories and get there so they have this concept of a feature so an epic may be made up of multiple features and features are services or groupings of functionality that can in and of themselves be broken down further into stories and stories or user stories these are specific usage scenarios that are granular enough to be completed within a single sprint. So, as I said before, in Agile projects, the user story is the fundamental work unit. So you should always strive to decompose your system down to stories and not necessarily so much about modules or components or subsystems or anything like that. So talking about uh, the user stories from end to end, you will see the, um, the different uh, service aspects of your architectural layers. Okay, so here is a, a real example of, of an epic feature story breakdown that I worked on from a recent project involving a GPS navigation system. So we'll call the epic location services. Okay, that's a pretty broad term. It's very high level, and so anything dealing with location of the car driver would belong to this epic. So what are some features that location services might provide. Um, a few examples, turn-by-turn -turn routing, we're all familiar with that nowadays. Uh, maybe some data-centric features such as my favorite destinations and also uh, maybe a trip computer. And then we break each of those features down into their uh, stories and um, so you'll see for the trip computer feature I broke it down into six user stories so um, in discussions about the trip computer feature we identified these six user stories and therefore conceived of these user stories through conversations about the type of functionality a trip computer needs and in particular the goals of the driver using the trip computer feature. So again, focus on what user stimulus will be made and the goals of the user. Now, user stories can be conceived really at any time throughout the product life cycle. If you've used this technique before, you'll, you'll understand what, what I mean by that. Uh, user stories seem to keep popping up all across the project schedule as we go. And that is not a bad thing. You know, as Agilists, we, we welcome change, and the, the art of discovering new user stories is definitely a good thing. So think about upfront planning, absolutely. User stories will be conceived. Discussing other stories, definitely. Maybe in the middle of implementation, some questions around how to implement it might see the need for an additional user story during a customer conversation, etc. Okay, now let's talk about the birth phase. So, user stories are born when they are written. So, whether you write the user story on a note card or within a tool, Let's consider that the birth of the user story. So again, I'm making a distinction between the utilization of the user story name, which in my mind is conception, versus uh, birthing the user's user story, which is the actual writing of the description and the acceptance criteria. So a few reminders here, be sure and keep the user stories high level. They are purposefully high level to encourage 
conversation and the clarification of the requirement through conversation. So also think of it as capturing the gist or the essence of the requirement. And um, you know, last point there, it's always a challenge to hurry up and get to Sprint 1. And at a minimum, you need to have the highest priority user stories written out and birthed um, and the clarifying conversations around them in order to start Sprint 1. So here's the syntax of the user story. You might be familiar with this already. And actually, there's a raging debate um, in Agile land. Half the Agilists believe that the syntax is useful, and the other half uh, believe that um, it's somewhat cumbersome. You don't really need it. Um, I'm kind of in the, the camp that says it is useful, especially if you're new to this technique, uh, use the syntax because as you can see looking at it, you know, as a role or who, that helps to set the context of the story and then explicitly identify what functionality you want as that particular person or role so that business value. So identifying the business value is very helpful and ma helps make sure that all of your user stories uh, will deliver that, uh, that stated value. And then acceptance criteria on the back side of the card or in the other section of your tool. Thinking of acceptance criteria while discussing requirements is a form of test-driven development. And, and so effectively we're going to write the acceptance criteria or you can think of it as some high level test cases. We're going to write that first as we're discussing the requirement. So it helps us, um, you know, uh, yep, go ahead. So you're showing away. these cards uh, which is the syntax of the user story on the other side of the card is the acceptance criteria. So who's writing this? What's the role? Is this a QA writing acceptance test and product owner writing the story or the team yeah. effort or some combination right. thereof? Yeah. The official answer from the Scrum Guide is that the product owner, the Scrum product owner, owns the responsibility of getting these user stories written. So what that means is if the Scrum product owner does not have helpful folks on their team, on their scrum team, then yes, he or she must write all of them. Now a little bit of history. When user stories were first invented in extreme programming by Kent Beck, he had the luxury of an on-site customer and he gave the responsibility of writing the user stories to their customer and that worked out really great. So um, in practical reality, the product owner typically does not write all of the user stories, but they should lead by example. And if they lead by example, it's relatively easy to enlist the help of the Scrum team uh, developers and QA and even the business analysts and uh, marketing and sales folks or internal stakeholders. So you may not have access to uh, direct access to your end customer, but if you do, see if they would be interested in helping write the user stories also. So Scrum product owner is the responsible person for it, but in reality it's a team effort and everybody pitches in and writes them. And who writes the acceptance test? Um, whoever writes the story. So it's not like um, one person writes the front of the card and then only QA writes the back of the card. That also is a team collaborative discussion. So whoever's writing the user story owns the responsibility of taking first stab at the acceptance criteria. Now, you mentioned QA. It's always a good idea to get the QA person to review the acceptance criteria. Why? Because these folks are great. They think differently than you and I do from a software development perspective. And if you think your acceptance criteria is reasonably thorough, hand it off to a QA person. They'll find three or four really important things that you may have neglected. So um, uh, again, it's whoever's writing the user story, but it's always a good idea to run the user story by the QA person 
Okay. That's good. Thing. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. Good question. So let's look at a real example here. So uh, this is a what a user story would look like for one of our trip computer feature stories. So I'm going to use the story start trip. So as a driver, I want to start my trip so that I can begin tracking my time and distance. And here's the acceptance criteria. I'll just read one of these, uh, the middle one. When I view the trip computer screen, I expect to see the distance field changing as I drive. I also expect to see the drive time field changing in one second increments. So you have the concept of the distance that I'm driving from a miles or kilometers perspective and my drive time from a one second increment perspective. Now, okay, so we've covered birth, uh, sorry, we've covered conception and birth. Now let's talk about the growth phase. Well, if you're a parent, I'm sure you will agree that your children just grow up way too fast. And user stories are a little bit different from that. Um, you know, some user stories follow a steady growth pattern and they're discussed a little bit up front and then the, about the middle of the project there's some growth indications and they mature later on in the project. Um, some user stories though are asked to grow up very quickly and in particular the highest priority stories are somewhat forced into maturity really quickly. And some are fine never growing up. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe my wife would claim that I've never really grown up. Um, these are likely the lowest priority stories or maybe the ones that are questionable or we're not really sure about but maybe those stories just never grow up. So to understand the growth dynamic a little better we need to keep in mind the product backlog. The product backlog in Scrum is a seminal artifact and it gives explicit guidance on which stories to develop right now and which ones are coming next and which ones are coming soon, dot, dot, dot. So typically the product backlog consists of 80, 80 to 90 percent of all the items in the product backlog will be the user story names. And uh, throughout the project, the user stories are shuffled up and down in the product backlog by the Scrum product owner. And this contributes to the growth factor as a relative position dictates the level of conversations that are needed at any one point in time. For example, stories at or near the top need some really heavy clarifying discussions right now. The next set needs some good discussions pretty soon. The stories in the middle of the product backlog need uh, probably a relatively small amount of discussion just for awareness, but not so much beyond that. And then the stories at the bottom don't really need much discussion at all until they start percolating up in priority. It's kind of a just-in-time just type discussion model. So, Mike, can we take one more question from now, you how, from that page? Yep. If you can bring up that page. Go ahead. So, so the, the picture in this page implies a in order uh, priority order from top to bottom. So to be able to put things at the bottom, you got to have somehow prioritized them. So how do you go about prioritizing when they are still in the early stage of uh, their life cycle? Yeah. Yeah, you really, and Scrum says the product owner is responsible for managing the product backlog and that is true. The product owner has to make the tough decision and make a distinction between the 80th item in the backlog and the 81st item in the backlog and oftentimes the product owner has multiple inputs to um, negotiating the priorities. Um, I would say the biggest one is business value. Uh, the product owner will look at the story names in the product backlog and just based on their understanding of the customer needs and goals and the dynamics of the team, he or she will uh, move 
stories that deliver mo the most business value up to the top or near the top. Another thing to consider that the product owner might consider is, especially if they're familiar with the lean startup approach or a lean startup disciple, is which user stories will give us the most learnings at the start of the project. And those would naturally gravitate up towards the top. Also, um, the software developers may be lobbying the product owner to choose this story and that story and move it up to the top because if we as a team address that in sprint one or sprint two, then a lot of the architectural plumbing has to be put in place to make that happen because the end-to-end -end scenario uh, goes very deep into the system. And the reason that's important to get done in one of the early sprints is because if you will take the time and effort to do it then, then a lot of the subsequent user stories just kind of fall in place with that plumbing that you've already built out for the previous user stories. So there's a number of factors. I think uh, Bob Galen in his book, Scrum Product Ownership, lists at least 15 different factors. But I'm going to touch on what I consider the top three there. Okay. So can I ask a follow up, follow up question on this prioritization, Mike? Yeah. So um, do you are the uh, are epics also being prioritized at the bottom of the of the pile here? Some are bigger chunks, and those may be epics not yet broken down into features and stories. So are they being prioritized alongside yeah. the stories in the top, or only stories get prioritized and epics end up staying as epics? some early stage well no um, yeah if um, you it, you will definitely have this situation where you have the name of an epic and everybody agrees that everything within that epic is lower priority than the other things and so the product owner will place that epic near at or near the bottom of their product backlog fully understanding that as that epic starts percolating up, a breakdown of that epic into user stories must occur. And that's, the, that's also a growth factor that uh, we're going to talk about here in just a minute. So, um, however, it could be the situation where you have an epic of where most of the stories are um, low priority, but there's one or two that are medium or high priority. So in that case, you kind of have to do that breakdown uh, a little earlier than you might like to get to those higher priority stories and pull those out of that epic and prioritize those accordingly up near the top of the list. So I've seen both situations, but generally epics are can be put at the bottom because they represent glumps, if you will, of user stories that just due to the area that they're in, it's lower priority than our, our uh, pressing needs. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. All right. Okay, so how, how can we help these user stories grow up? Well, um, and again, recall that user stories are purposefully high level and as such, they require clarifying conversations. One way to do this is, uh, you've probably heard of this, is the three amigos method. It's a collaborative discussion amongst three project roles. Now, these three project roles are developers, QA, and either the product owner or the business analyst. Now, this method is not meant to be restrictive, so the more participants, the better. So think of it as um, you know, kind of a minimal requirement that these three roles need to be played in order to have a good clarifying discussion. Again, it doesn't prevent hallway conversations or lunchtime conversations about it, but uh, uh, definitely uh, you want to strive to have these three roles. And also, again, as a reminder, stakeholders, customers, marketing, business roles, definitely, if they're available, can be part of these discussions.
So these conversations spur the growth of a user story to the point of becoming more and more clear and discussing acceptance criteria, adding some acceptance criteria, modifying some others will help us identify when this story becomes acceptable to the customer. So, um, you know, as these discussions ensue, the tacit knowledge is built up within the team. And also, if you're a fan of Kent Beck's extreme programming um, agile method, he has this concept, or it's actually a principle called whole team, which emphasizes that each team member is valued and belongs to something larger, uh, namely the team. And these three amigo conversations can help emphasize this concept uh, in the spirit of inclusiveness. Now let's go back to the uh, start trip user story and um, after a three amigos conversation we might have found a few clarifications shown in red so uh, the business value for start trip has been modified to include a clause which further clarifies it um, and it says so that I can begin in tracking my time and distance in order to accurately fill out my expense report and then as we held these uh, three Amigo conversations, we found an additional acceptance criteria. And it reads, when I view the trip computer screen, I expect to see buttons for stop, save, and reset. Ooh, and guess what? If we do not yet have a user story for stop and save and reset, then we better add those user stories right now. And as you can see, the user story grows uh, through these conversations, and we add notes to the user story, and, and it's basically firming it up. Another important growth factor is when the user story receives an estimate. Um, you can use story points, probably the most popular, or t-shirt sizes, even hours or man days, doesn't really matter, but estimates become really important in sprint planning. They help, uh, help the team make a righteous choice for the upcoming sprint, and they're also very useful in release planning. They help the team predict what will be there in a future release, and I'm always amazed in, in my Agile projects when we do a release plan, how reasonably accurate that is. Um, and, and I always hearken back to my waterfall traditional experience and remind myself and the team that waterfall really doesn't have anything similar to measuring velocity and using that to reasonably accurately predict an upcoming release. So big advantage to Agile right there. Well, at times a user story requires some experience that the team just doesn't have. Um, in this case, uh, the story grows from, an addition, from the additional learnings of what's called a research spike. So um, this may involve study of some reference code. It may involve some internet research. It may involve development of a prototype or downloading a new technology stack and playing with it to become more familiar with it. Um, research spikes are intended to be time constrained and exploratory and typically a single sprint with a subset of your team members or I guess in the rare case your entire team. Um, and I like to um, equate this to a growth spurt. Uh, it's analogous to that in that we know a lot more about the story than we did before. Now the story is prioritized. Um, we have good clarity of requirements based on the three amigo discussions and or research spikes and the story has an estimate. So now we're ready for implementation. So when the story is placed into a sprint backlog and broken down into its respective tasks, the story experiences a significant growth event. And that's because now all of a sudden we understand a lot more about that story and in particular 
the how aspect, how the implementation is going to proceed or um, you know, these are the tasks that are needed to implement the story. I can we take a couple questions on this, this stage? Sure. So one is on the story estimate that you just talked about. Uh, does that estimate when it comes back either in story points or t-shirt sizing or man hours as you said, any of those uh, units, does that play back into the prioritization in the sense that big stories yes. get moved down, small yep. stories move up? So that's, let's take yep. one qu that question then I'll come to a second. Yes, yes, it absolutely does. Um, the the size, a relative size of the story does it is a contributing factor to prioritization, and primarily it's about okay, is this story right sized so that if the team chooses it, it could be done within a single sprint. If it's not right sized. Then, then it's deserving of some more conversation to break it down into its sub-user stories, if you will, or it's the classic epic to user story breakdown. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that you might find a user story that is end-to-end uh, -end in nature that does not fit within a sprint, and if it does, there's there's some pretty classic techniques of how to deal with that. Basically, identify a DMARC point and implement the top half of the story in in this sprint, along with the DMARC point that returns a success code, and then in in the very next sprint, implement the bottom half and throw out the DMARC point and do the integration and then demo the full end-to-end -end slice, things like that. But for the most part, it, uh, estimates do contribute to the priority. Right, and the second related question that you started to touch on anyways is when the estimate estimation happens, uh, what's, uh, how does the team know when this it is too big? And one definition you already gave on too big is if it doesn't fit in the sprint. But aside from yeah. even if it fits in the sprint, is there any guideline on what is what story estimate should be considered as too big and therefore worthy of breaking down? Yeah, yeah, it's really an art. Um, there's no hard and fast rules other than it should fit in a single sprint. Um, the other advice I would give you, though, is as much as possible, you want your user stories to be a thin functional slice of of um, end to end logic throughout your system. For example, if the user presses the play button, you should have a user story called play video, and ideally, that thin functionality um, will be able to be modeled and implemented within a single sprint. So um, the, the only real rule that I'm aware of is it must be, should be able to fit into a sprint, but then, um, but then you can think of the user actions and um, you know, try to keep it slim and, and thin so that um, a user story can be done in three to four days. And, and there's some techniques for how to get there. You know, oftentimes when you're dealing with alternate paths and variants and derivatives, you think, oh my gosh, even though it's a it's start video player, um, there's no way that can be done in a single week or single two week sprint. Well, what you can do is pull out some of those alternate paths and make them their own user stories. You know, maybe it's something like, um, um, you know, handle the um, the exception cases for when the video player does not start or something like that. So there's ways you can bust out the uh, the full set of functionality into separate stories just to ensure that you're kind of at that right granular granular level. And again, a lot of it is art and the more you experience this, the better at it you'll get. So, Mike, let's take one other clarification. You talked about a few minutes ago about uh, using the top half or the bottom half to break a story down. Does that go against the sashimi slicing kind of a thought process around, or are you, were you implying something? Yes, it, it absolutely does go against the sashimi. So it's the rare case 
it should never be the norm. I must admit, oftentimes I'll engage with a team new to Agile, and they think that what it is is just defining those DMARC points and and writing code to that and demonstrating that. But that was never the intent. It was intended to be a full, fully functional end-to-end slice. So um, yeah, it uh, definitely stay within the spirit of Scrum and it's effectively a fundamental tenet of Agile also. So, no, I was uh, describing the extremely rare case where even a thin functional slice just due to complexity or size reasons cannot be done in a single sprint. But don't let your team kind of opt, opt out for that. Keep them in the opt-in mode. That's good clarification. Thank you, Mike. Good. Yeah, that was an excellent question. Okay, let's keep going here. So we talked about uh, the breakdown of the task, and that and that that's a significant uh, uh, growth factor. So uh, let's go back to the uh, start trip story. Here are some potential tasks for that story, and as you can see, these also contribute to the growth of the story from an implementation perspective. And look, uh, there's even set trip timer, uh, design a trip database record, calculate the distance, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so we've gone through conception, birth, and growth. Now let's talk about maturity. So in my mind, user stories mature when they are implemented. Um, you know, we focus on working the task within the sprint, and the, and also you know those those are identified in the sprint planning uh, meeting, and oftentimes we'll find new tasks as we're implementing. So, um, you know we're going to mature that user story by firming up the task and actually implementing them. And anytime we implement. Um, we have to cross-check that against the definition of done, or we should. So many Agile teams use the definition of done to know really when a user story is done. So becoming done is a significant maturation step. Examples of um, definition of done for a user story might be, um, you know, uh, the following things. The code adheres to our coding guidelines. The code has been reviewed by at least one other person. The code builds automatic, automatically without error. Um, we have automated unit tests that run green for that user story, etc. And many times the user story must, and the implementation of it, must morph to achieve the definition of done. Now let's go back to the start trip story and then let's see how that matures. So kind of focus in on the uh, red rectangle there. We had written previously, I also expect to see the drive time field changing in one second increments. So during implementation, we were showing this to the QA person and they were about to give it a big thumbs up and then she asked a very important question does drive time start immediately when I select the start trip button or does it wait until I actually start driving? And we had a big uh-oh moment or oops moment. So we checked with the business analyst who confirmed that drive time should start only when driving. So this caused us to um, to do some uh, rework inside our code and we went back to the user story and um, uh, kind of busted out a previous acceptance criteria into a separate one uh, of its own that says when I begin driving I expect to see the drive time field changing in one second increments. And like I said, it involved a code change and, and then finally after that the QA person was good with it and we got their thumbs up uh, within the sprint. So um, let's talk about demonstration. Demonstration is a culmination of a lot of hard work, effort, and conversations. 
When demoed, the user story experiences a significant maturation event because there's going to be there's likely to be uh, feedback on that demonstration. Um, there can be a thumbs up or thumbs down from the QA person or the product owner, um, and that's also um, a maturation tag of sorts of sorts. So. If it's thumbs down, then there's some rework required and some additional maturation towards doneness and accept being becoming acceptable to the uh, product owner and the um, and the QA folks. So for the start trip, um, you know, um, we as a team we, we would demonstrate that the that the drive time field does indeed start incrementing when the car begins moving, but not before. Deployment to the field is a final uh, maturation step, and um, uh, which is actually getting the user story into the customer's hands. Um, at this point, you may receive feedback from the customers or even a few bugs. And guess what? Uh, fixing bugs or improving the user story is an additional maturation factor. So, uh, just to kind of summarize here, we've got task breakdown. We've got implementation, integration, and testing. We've got definition of done assessment, and we've got receiving feedback from demos and deployment. And all of these contribute to maturation. Okay, so finally, let's discuss end of life. Well, there are various reasons for a user's story to experience end of life. Um, a couple of those are the user story is not really needed anymore. Uh, maybe the product is decommissioned. Maybe the project is canceled, etc. cetera. Um, whatever the reason is, um, there's no need to mourn. In general, it's just a natural progression of systems development. So, And this certainly applies to user stories also. So let's conclude here. So I believe that you. Let's clarify, yep. Let me clarify the terminology in the end of life that you're saying. So when a story goes through the the entire cycle and they're deployed in the field and users are using it, uh, so long as users are using it, it is a yes. life, still a live story yes. in production use, right? So yes. The end of life yes. only happens if it has been removed. Okay. Functionality is removed. In that, the production. Yes. That. That is exactly right, and and thank you for introducing that because this slide probably needs a statement to that effect. Uh, um, the user story, uh, if it's still, if the system is still out in the field and that uh, feature or user story is still being utilized by customers or clients, then absolutely, it's it's still live out there, and um, and we can be proud of that. Uh, at some point, maybe the 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 product hits its end of life cycle or it's decommissioned or and oftentimes it's supplanted with um, a new evolution of the of the product um, at that point uh, you might consider that the end of life for that user story so excellent clarification thank you for that sure. okay let's conclude and wrap up um, I believe user stories follow a, a, a life cycle analogous to human life, and you can think of it through through those five phases. Um, and I think you know thinking of user stories throughout these life cycle phases can help us all achieve a more in-depth understanding of the user story technique. And with that, um, here's just a brief commercial about Three Beacons. Um, we specialize in Scrum team training, um, agile immersion, user stories, as you might expect. Uh, we have a lot of experience in that, and even extreme programming if you're looking for how to develop high-quality software. Um, and we also do consulting. And that's the end of it. I'm going to turn it over to Hemant here to step us through the centers, a few centers of slides. Hemant? Sounds good. So uh, for audience, uh, thanks, uh, Mike. So for audience, we'll take uh, questions now. I already have a few questions in the inbox, but um, while you guys think through the content and, and uh, keep sending more questions, uh, in that meantime, I'll quickly introduce Synergip and then we'll come back to take some really good questions. So, uh, Mike, if you can advance the pages so I can talk to Synergip introduction for 
audience who have not been exposed to Synergy so far. So we are, in a nutshell, we are a software product development partner company for small to mid-sized software uh, technology companies. And uh, we help all our clients uh, essentially uh, accelerate their product roadmap by putting together a team of high caliber software professionals, which is a dedicated team for each client and works as an extension of the in-house team. And we following agile practices and just good sound software development practices, we help our clients reduce the risk that is inherent in building uh, new software. And we also reduce the cost by leveraging our offshore India-based software development center. Typically, we're able to provide a 50% cost advantage to a client. And while they're getting these benefits of acceleration of product roadmap and risk reduction and cost reduction, they still maintain the flexibility, long-term flexibility our clients do by having the ability to turn that operation, a team that is working for them at Synerzip into their own captive team whenever they feel the need to do that. So that's what Synerzip does. Uh, all our clients are long-term clients, and this next page shows a glimpse of some of our clients, um, a few large companies, but mostly mid-sized software companies. That's the focus. Typically, venture back growth stage software companies. With that, uh, let me give a little plug to the next uh, month's webinar and our ongoing series of Agile webinars. Our next webinar next month is going to be on analysis in Agile. That's a very a, a difficult topic for agilists to focus how much analysis is too much and, and how much is adequate for the purposes of good software development. So we'll cover that topic next month uh, on April 15th. So do plan to join us, presented by Kent, Kent McDonald. He's uh, definitely an expert on the topic. So with that, let's turn our attention back to this topic of life cycle of a user story and the questions that go with it. So if you're ready, Mike, I'll take some questions um, that are in the queue. I'm ready. Sure. Okay, so the first one is, uh, is the role of QA going away because of Agile? So the point is often Agile practice seems to talk about test-driven development where the whole of development is involved in testing. Mm -hmm. So the specific role of QA, does that seem to go away in the Agile context? Well, the answer is no, uh, emphatic no. And as a matter of fact, the role of QA in an Agile organization is much elevated and um, so so think of it as this the role of a QA person in an agile team um, it changes from a traditional role in that the QA person is the developer of test case automation and they're focusing in on the acceptance criteria of the user stories and figuring out a way how to automate the testing of the user story commitment for that sprint and they're working hand in hand with the developers and they're they're watching their progress and doing the best they can to anticipate what is going to be uh, developed within that sprint and and the anticipation they will turn into test case automation. So um, you'll hear the phrase test-driven development, and mostly that's about unit testing from the developer perspective. So make no mistake, quality starts with the developers, the software developers writing uh, the, the code, and they should be writing unit tests either before or hand-in-hand -hand with their uh, production code. Now the QA role in an Agile team is to automate the behavioral testing which is typically described by the acceptance criteria in the user story. So uh, in order to do that they have to work very closely with the developers. So it's no longer this traditional world where the QA team is a separate team and the product is pitched over this wall of uncertainty is what I call it and as software developers we tell the QA folks good luck you only have three weeks to test it before launch and that's when disaster hits so the so just in summary the role changes the responsibility um, becomes more of a uh, uh, test case automation person and um, and in effect it's a, a specialized developer is a way to think about it Excellent, thanks. let's take next question which is when you have an existing system uh, in place 
So by your life cycle definition, it has matured user stories. These are features being used. Um, right. So, and you are now modifying an existing user story. So I guess there's some uh, enhancement request there. Yeah. What is the best practice? Create a new user story and retire the old or modify the existing story and represent the new requirement with the modification? Oh, yeah, really good question. Um, I would think a best practice is um, if you're really, if that code base for the existing system was developed using the user story approach, I think the best thing to do is go back to the original user story and modify that. And again, it's a, it's, it's a growth factor. Um, modify that, the, the description and acceptance criteria associated with that, and include that as a record in your current project or your support maintenance um, approach. So, uh, and then obviously do the, do the coding changes. Now, oftentimes existing systems were developed without using the user story approach, at, then my advice would be write a brand new user story, but keep it focused on the change. Don't feel like you you have to, you're obligated to go back and describe everything about that user story. Try your best to just keep it focused on the change. Excellent, thanks. Let's take another somewhat related question, but may warrant a separate answer. So what's the value of keeping a user story after it's successfully been deployed to production? The value is that um, this is the user story in action. This is the end goal of all of the conversations and design thinking and implementation and unit testing and behavioral testing and stress testing and to, to get it out to the field. So um, that's the culminating highlight of all of that work. So, um, you know, most software systems, once they get out to the field, they have to be supported. So it's always good if your support team has the mental model of this system is a collection of user stories that are currently active out in the field. So, um, you know, as as bug fixes are needed or improvements are needed, let's model those and um, and drive those based on the user story. Okay, thanks. Uh, let, let's take another question, um, Mike, which is on this done criteria. Can you talk a little bit about the variety? Uh, ex what what a reasonable uh, I know you had a picture or a graph or a table in your slides, but a good done criteria uh, is should it be yeah. deployed to production or should it be code complete? Some guidance on what's an appropriate yeah. done criteria to do things. Yeah, and this and this is always a discussion amongst the team. You definitely want the team to come up with this, and it's not mandated from above because. Um, that way, uh, you know, the team will feel ownership of it. Now, over the course of time, you may have, you know, from project to project, kind of a consistent definition of done coming up, but always have the team review it and see if they can recommit it to it. But at a minimum, at a minimum, it needs to be along the lines of the code adheres to the coding guidelines. Um, you should have coding standards, documented coding standards for JavaScript or Java or Objective-C, whatever programming language you're using. There are always some constructs to avoid, some techniques to, to do instead of the, you know, one way versus this way, some stylistic options, because you do want consistency of the code. So at a minimum, the code should adhere to the coding standards plus the code has been reviewed. If you, if you use pair programming, that's reviewing as you go. If you don't use pair programming, then establish a buddy system where you and a buddy uh, review each other's code and give feedback to it. So um, also the code for the story to be done, the code must be source, co source um, 
controlled in SVN or whatever your repository is. So there's kind of a bare minimum there, which are good practices that every software development team should use. And then, you know, you can start building on that. If you don't yet do unit testing, but you would like, then, then add the automated uh, unit test um, uh, run from a continuous integration perspective as part of the definition of done. And that, um, you know, the entire system goes green with your new user stories integrated, things like that, and then and then step it up, uh, you know, over time. Introduce the concept of complexity analysis. Um, you know what? Um, I've read um, methods in classes that go on for 30 pages long. Shame on all of us for doing that. <laughs> the com the cyclomatic complexity of that method would probably be 200. Which means I, as a normal human being, software engineer trained, cannot understand that method. So keep your methods short, and they should all fall, uh, you know, under cyclomatic complexity of 10 or 15. Uh, so introduce that topic as a way to step out. Oh, here's another one: memory leaks. My gosh, if you're not checking for memory leaks, that's that's probably the number one reason applications crash, right? So just uh, kind of successively add to your definition of done, introduce the tools that will let you do that relatively easy so that people don't feel this huge pain of having to do all of this overhead work. Uh, start with something simple, but then add something every project after that. Uh, let's take another question. Thanks, Mike. Let's take another one, which is um, if at the time of iteration demo, uh, the story is not accepted by the product owner, what happens in the life cycle? Does it get now logged as a defect or what happens? Yeah, it's like uh, asking the beautiful girl for a date and she rejects you. You you have to <laughs> that story is not uh, it's definitely not demoed right because the product owner has not accepted it and uh, so it's a try again next sprint so it's a, it it carries over to the next sprint and then um, you know again the the reimplementation of it or the additional items that seem to be missing all of those in the next sprint all of that, that activity contributes to uh, the growth factor and and actually it's a very good point because you can think of uh, you know it has to be a certain age or a certain growth level to be able to be demonstrated uh, in the in the sprint review so if it's not up to par or not at that growth level it gets pitched over to the next sprint and also as a reminder you want that to be the rare case not the norm but it maintains in the life cycle still as a status of a story yes. that is continuing to mature. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, exactly. It's still, it's, yep. yep. Uh, let's take one, fine, maybe a final question. Um, are there any other techniques you suggest to you uh, beyond what you covered here uh, in this webinar for prioritization? For example, uh, there are parts, uh, some followers of Agile um, talk about this notion of value points which is ascribing certain set of uh, yeah. full po set of points to a pro software project or a product and then using yeah. that relative distribution to do prioritization as a way. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, actually that is a good technique. I personally have not ever used it, but I have read about it and it looks very interesting. And I like the idea because every user story in your product backlog or every work item in your product backlog has some associated value and if you can put a numeric rating on that then it, then then that should help the product owner prioritize those if something has a 30 value rating versus a 5 value rating then absolutely the question becomes how do you come up with that numeric value 
Is it primarily driven by business value or is it an amalgamation of everything that we've been talking about, uh, including business value? How much learning will we get from that? Is it architecturally significant? Is it, you know, from a time-based perspective, do we want to do this one first? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So maybe it's a, an amalgamation of all of that thinking, which can only be of a big benefit. So. Yes, definitely uh, I would advise uh, the value point system, but I would also advise uh, your listeners to read more about Lean Startup and um, how to treat your project as a collection of assumptions and reword those assumptions into hypotheses. And then what are the product backlog work items that can answer that hypotheses either in the positive or negative uh, sense um, because in, in the lean startup community it's all about learning so which of these user stories will help us learn the most and, and that and, sounds like and, an excellent topic for one of the upcoming webinars Mike doesn't it well we'll have to talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that's definitely a good topic for uh, one of our webinars uh, that are due for next few months but Thank you so much for sure. covering this yeah. topic of life cycle of a user story. You're welcome. Uh, version. And uh, thank you all for attending on the audience site. But stay tuned for next month, April 15th. We will have our next webinar and as is the national. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.